Good evening, everyone. This is Dolores Cannon with the Metaphysical Hour. We were a little late because there was electronic problems again. We always have little gremlins that are on the line that like to play with our electronics and technology. But we're we're going live now. And this is June the 22nd, 2012. So you know we're still doing live uh, call performances for another couple of weeks, and then we're going to be going into the archives again. Uh, we are still, for the next few weeks, we're interviewing our speakers and the authors that are going to be at our conference. We're having the seventh Transformation Conference in Rogers, Arkansas, July the 13th to the 15th. And we're really getting excited about it because it is really getting close. It'll be here before we know it. So we've been interviewing on our show a lot of the ones that are going to be speakers. So we're going to have another one tonight. He's a keynote speaker at the conference. His name is Wayne Peterson. And he has a lot of very interesting information to share, too. So, Wayne, are you there? I I hope I'm here. Okay, now we can hear you good. <laughs> okay, thank you. We never know. You're repeating in and out of dimensions, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> uh, now, we got you back into our dimension. Let's I'll stay there for a while. <laughs> okay. okay. Before we start, I want to give out the toll-free number in case anyone does want to call in and ask questions tonight. And it's one eight 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 six two seven. 6008-888-627-6008. That number is good all over the world. And if you have questions, I would like you to, to focus on our guest. And we're going to wait about a half hour to let him give his story and everything before we start taking calls. But if you're interested, some people just like to listen. That's perfectly all right, too. But, okay, Wayne. Uh, and you're going to be a keynote at the conference, but I want you to tell people about yourself. I always start with having the guests give everybody their background and how you got into metaphysics and all of this field. Talk about your background first. Well, um, I suppose uh, I can start with simply saying that um, <clears throat> when I uh, was about to uh, finish my um, college work, I I ran into a man who was recruiting for the Peace Corps, and they were setting up a little exhibit about a week before my graduation. And he simply said to me, are you about to graduate? I said, yes. And he said, what are you going to do? I said, I really don't know. <laughs> and at that point, he said, I think the Peace Corps would be perfect for you. I didn't realize I was talking to David Rockefeller, and um, when I asked what his name was, he said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm David Rockefeller. And I said, well, that's strange, because there's a David Rockefeller in New York, president of the you know Chase Manhattan Bank, and he said, oh, I'm, I'm the guy. But he did <laughs> convince me that going to Brazil with the Peace Corps, because I told him, well, one of the reasons... I didn't like the Peace Corps policy of you had to go where they sent you. And I wanted to go to Brazil. And he said, well, do you speak the language? I said, yes, fluently. And he said, well, then what's the problem? I said, well, I don't want to be out in the jungle. And he said, I can arrange that. So every request I had, he said, I can arrange it. So that's why I asked him, well, who are you that you can arrange all these things? But I did have a wonderful program in Brazil, and it did get the attention of the American ambassador in Brazil who invited me in one day and said, what are you going to do after the Peace Corps? And I said, well, I'm not sure. And he said, well, I have a job for you. I want you to come back and work at the embassy here with us. So that's how I got into the diplomatic service. And uh, I did that for a number of years in Asia, Africa, obviously, and Brazil. And um, so you're sort of wondering, well, where does my sort of uh, spiritual uh, background come into this? Well, I started late. And uh -huh. it wasn't until I was back in Washington at a job in Washington 
that I began to have a few um, little expansions of consciousness. There were some strange things happening in my life. And that's when I heard about um, a book that Mr. Benjamin Krem read about the uh, wrote about the reappearance of the Christ. This is based on Alice Bailey's book, a uh, very much the same title. And when I read the book, I realized that uh, he was going to be in Washington D.C. on a lecture tour, and I went to that. And of course, the very first time I met him, I also ended up sitting next to a strange man I met at this program, and after a while I realized that this was the one that Benjamin Krem calls the reappeared Christ, or uh, we just call him Maitreya. The Buddhist would call him Maitreya Buddha, of course, because that's the name they would understand him by. But it was uh, the beginning of a whole new approach uh, to viewing, I would say, a totally different aspect of the way our world functions. And being in the government, I began to try to find out how many people in the world, because I did travel extensively around the world, and would meet with heads of state and other important people. And I learned that they all knew about this guy named Maitreya. Naturally, I couldn't do any public speaking on it because I was a government employee. And at my level, of course, the State Department would have demanded a big outline of what I was going to speak of on. And I don't believe that they would have approved of me talking about the <laughs> appeared Christ. Uh -huh. um, and that, that went on until the White House Someone at the White House called me one day and said, Mr. Peterson, we know you have a connection with Maitreya, and we'd like to talk to you. And I said, who are you? And they said, well, it doesn't matter. We'd just like to talk with you. So I said, fine, set up an appointment. And they wanted me to tell officials at the Vatican about what I knew. And I said, Why? And they said, well, we're curious, but we don't want anyone in the Vatican to know that we're curious about this story as well. So I was sort of being used as a pawn, and that was a, num a lot of years ago. So I can be a little more open about it now because it was a long time ago, and there's more people in the world who know now that we're going through a very different time. But I was intrigued that... Uh, there were so many high officials that were interested. It was about the same time that I think many people know about the visionaries in Medjugorje, where the Catholic Church very much promotes, because a group of children, who are now adults, of course, were having conversations with one of the spiritual beings that they just recognized as Mother Mary, the mother of Jesus. So all of this started that long ago? Oh, long ago, yes. And, I thought um, Maitreya was only like 20, 30 years, but that's a lot longer. Well, he, he came in 1977, uh -huh. so that's quite a while back. Okay. Uh, but that's when I got a call and said, well, the, uh, some of the visionaries from Medjugorje are coming to Washington, and there's a meeting, and we'd like you to be there. And I said, well, I don't know if I want to bother. And they said, well, um, it's a very select audience. And when they started telling me who was there, essentially it was the president's cabinet ministers. So we had the secretary of state and the secretary of defense and the secretary of this and that. And I said, I can't believe these people would be interested. Well, they were. Hmm. And so I think the point I'm making here is really this is not a secret among political and economic and even scientific leaders, but it seems to be very much a story that the general public does not hear about unless you're part of the New Age community. The one person that does speak out about this quite forcefully, of course, is Mikhail Gorbachev of Russia. Uh, who I met a few years ago, and 
he goes around giving talks on precisely this, that governments need to readjust for the coming shift that's taking place, and they need to come forward now and tell the general public in the world what is going on, rather than trying to hide it because they don't know particularly how they're going to present this. So essentially, that's what I've been doing in the last uh, year since I retired and uh, came here to Henderson, Nevada, and wrote a book about my sort of contacts with Maitreya Plus, a lot of the other spiritual beings that Alice Bailey or Helena Blavatsky would simply call the masters of the hierarchy or masters of wisdom. There's many names that can be used, and we often get caught up on names which aren't really important at all. It's about what is happening and uh, how we are going to deal with this new world that we're trying to deal with. So that's pretty much it, Dolores. Okay. But, you know, I don't want to doubt you, but... I just want to say the things that I've heard about Maitreya, because, you know, I'm, my work goes back into the 70s and 80s. Uh, they kept saying that no one had ever seen him, that even Benjamin Krim had never seen him. And there was only one photograph that exists. So that's what it, the most startling thing you said was that you have actually seen him. Um, yeah, not only seen him, but he, he pops up. Quite often, I I would believe that tens of thousands of people have seen him. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe not Benjamin Krem, because that's maybe the way his work goes. But he when he appeared in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, back in 1988, they did get a few photos of him. Yeah, the that's problem the one is, heard. Yeah, that was on CNN quite a bit at that time. It was on the front page of the Times of London at that time. And many newspapers in the world had that because he he appeared before about 6,000 people. And he did it by materializing a body out of thin air, which certainly shocked them. And he disappeared at the end of that 20-minute program or so in the same manner. He just dissolved back into air. So it was a very, so almost, I would think, traumatic for the people who watched this in person and saw it, but it was just fortunate that there were some reporters there, not for him, but for the woman who had attracted all these people, who was a very popular healer. So he's been doing this before audiences, and very often, I know, especially in Europe when I gave lectures, he would appear... And he'd be talking to people in the back of the room. And I, I suspect they had no idea who he was. <laughs> That's what I was wondering. You said he, you suspect thousands of people all over the world have seen him, but you think they probably didn't really realize who he was? No, and that's that's a little tricky play, is that he really wants people to recognize the Christ consciousness in every human being. And many people have, I think, uh, a certain image in their mind that they would think he would look like, and he doesn't. Uh, if he doesn't fit that image, well, then they simply reject it. But what happens usually, and many people have told me this very same story, is that after seeing him, they think nothing of it, and then for days they have dreams about this, and they can't get him out of their mind. And the reason is is that he keeps feeding them this image so that they will begin to realize they have actually seen him. But there are there are others now too that are about to come forward, very much in the same vein. I think that Maitreya has, and um, then it will get a little more complex. Mm-hmm. But do you think the Maitreya appears differently to different people? He can do that. Um, yes, he has. He has such an expanded consciousness. I would. I would guess he can. He can appear simultaneously in a thousand different places. But he does have one core body and one core image. So uh, 
it is if if he appears in that core image, then you can touch him, and he feels very real. Real, but I notice that if he's not in that core body, it's sort of an uh, apparition on the etheric plane, and then he can't be touched. He says, you know, can't be touched now. Well, that's because there's really nothing there. And uh, when he does that, he can change his image. And uh, I know I've given talks a few times, and then people who are leaving, one woman, for example, after I gave a, a talk, got in the elevator, and there he was. And she said, you know, you sort of look like my Treya that Mr. Peterson was just talking about. And as she stood and looked at him, his image changed five times along with his clothes just to show <laughs> this ability he has to change this image. And she said all the while he did it, he was singing a song. So we never quite know what his purpose is. And, of course, the people who see it say, well, why did he do this? Well, I don't know why he does it. I think it's just creating expectation that things are going to change and we should get used to the fact that the human kingdom and this fifth kingdom from which Maitreya is part of, the veil is thinning between these two. And that also goes for the Deva kingdom. And that veil is thinning, and we are soon going to have many, many people being able to see through this thin veil and see the Devas, see the Masters, and that goes for extraterrestrials as well, who usually reside in very etheric bodies. This is going to give us a sense of universal brotherhood when we can see these things. And that will be a very big change in the way I think we live and relate to one another, that we're not just a few accidents of history that we are a human race, but we don't know if there's anything else that exists, we're seen, soon going to be able to not only see, but communicate with all these other kingdoms that we hear about. I would think most of the majority of the people in this country believe there are angels, but how many have actually seen them? Mm -hmm. uh, some people claim to, but I think when more than half the population can see them, and communicate, that's going to change everything. Mm -hmm. Well, in my work, I'm always finding people who can communicate with the fairies and the the gnomes and, you know, the yeah. elves and everything. They do communicate with the nature spirits. They said they see them, but... Oh, but that's in the session, correct? No, it's... Oh, happened, oh, it's uh, yeah, they said many of them have this ability because they're out in nature a lot. They're close to nature. Yes. And I know other people say they see angels, but sometimes they doubt it afterwards. But that's I, we do agree with you that the veil is thinning because there's many things happening now. It's to get us used to this, that things are definitely changing. Yeah, you don't want to... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I can't wait. I keep asking to see them. And uh, Wayne, I wasn't introduced. This, I'm Julia. I'm Dolores' daughter. We do the show together, so yeah. And <laughs> she was in there. <laughs> she's uh, the one that runs the company too. So she likes to help me with this and talk to the uh, guests also. Well, yeah, we're like, pleased to have you with us. Oh, well, thank okay. you. <laughs> we're glad to have you too. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, but that's one of the things I, I can't wait for these things because I'm always asking. I want to see. Uh, the E.T. brothers, and I want to see the divas, and I want to see, you know, all these things. And it's like, I know it's so close, and I, I can almost feel it, but it's like, where are you? Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Well, that is, it, it, it's fascinating to me because sometimes uh, when I give a talk, uh, I will see one or another of several masters um, that do appear at times, and then after, I will check with the audience and say, how many actually saw someone else up here with me? And there'll always mm. be three or four people out of a hundred that will say yes, and they will describe them perfectly. And the others will say, we didn't see a thing. And yeah. so it's curious to me how some 
can see this very clearly and others can't see anything. Right. Yeah, that happens a lot in my lectures and my classes that I'm giving. In the beginning, you know, people would come up and they'll say, you're going to think I'm crazy, but... But now it happens about every time I give a lecture or a right. class and somebody will come up later and they said, I saw a being standing next to you. Or sometimes they see several around yeah. me and sometimes they just see them as lights. But other times there will be definite forms. So I know people are, but then the rest of the people didn't see anything. Right. Well, I think some people, you know, just we, that you get your information in different ways. And I would love to be able to see. I mean, I'll see different things, but, you know, some people hear, some people feel, some people see. Um, so and I would I would love to be one of those that sees, but mm -hmm. I'm not, right? I'm not yet. <laughs> not yet, okay. But you can hear. That's I can a... hear and I can see. I'll see visuals. But I won't necessarily see like what you're saying there, a being, mm -hmm. you know, saying this. I'm, I'm hoping when you're here, because I heard through the grapevine that we might have a visit, and so I'm really <laughs> hoping that I can see it. <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe you're, maybe they're following you around. Huh? <laughs> well, it's it, it's it's interesting um, because I have some friends who can see very clearly on their own very often when these things happen. And yet at other times, um, I will be standing right next to my tray having a conversation, and then he disappears, and they're only six feet away, and they say, I didn't see anything. I said, yes, but a half an hour ago, you did see him. What's the difference? Why could you mm -hmm. not see it a half, or could see it a half hour ago, and now it's only 30 minutes later, and he's six feet away from you, and you couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. part of that is also controlled by those who appear. There has to be something like that. I was, yes, I was like just going to say that. <laughs> but, That's you know, I, <laughs> I did one talk, and afterwards this man came up, and he said, who was that man that came on stage and stood in back of you for about five minutes and then walked off? <laughs> and he said he'd asked the ones around him. He said, nobody saw anything. And I said, well, I didn't know there was anybody there. So this was a physical person that someone saw. But, but Dolores, you know, can, can you at times feel the energy from them? If they well, appear? I know when I'm lecturing, they're always with me, but I call them my guides and guardians that help me with the yeah. lectures and the classes. But I don't know if it's the same thing or not. But this was actually a physical person that someone saw. I think they appear in many different ways. We just don't yeah. uh, really recognize it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that's mm -hmm. true. But people do feel energy in the room, and I feel energized because that's what keeps me mm -hmm. up there lecturing. <laughs> so yes. I don't know if it's the same thing that you're talking about, but it may it maybe everybody has a different names for them. Yes, and I, I remember doing a lecture some years ago in Seattle, Washington. It was at the Paramahansa Yogananda Center, and I thought, well, this has to have good energy. And as people came in, they kept saying, there's a man outside standing by the door who's shaking hands with everybody and inviting them in. Who is that? And I said, I don't know. You know, I'm new here. They all thought it was my Maitreya, but I purposely did not go out and look because I didn't want to be in the position of saying, yes, it is, no, it isn't, because individuals uh -huh. are supposed to make up their own minds about this. So he didn't come in, but um, after it was over, I went across the street to their bookstore to sign books for people, and people coming in and say, oh, the guy we think is my tray is now in the front of the bookstore. Come and talk to him. I said, no, not until I finish signing books for people here. Then I'll go up. Well, by the time I was finished, I said, where is he? And they said, well, now he left the store. He's out in the middle of the street. Well, we're in downtown <laughs> Seattle, and there's right at a crossroads. And, you know, it's about six lanes of traffic in both directions. And there's oh. a guy in white standing in the middle there, in the middle of the night, 
and it was dark, and of course Seattle's always a little wet. There's a mist coming down, and all these people are huddled around the awning of the bookstore watching him, but no one will go out there. And they said, uh-huh. oh, everybody's afraid to go out there. So I said, well, I have to go out there and just see if it is my trailer, just some crazy guy standing in the middle of the street. But there was no traffic. Suddenly, at this uh, not very late, like 8.30 in the evening, there wasn't a car in sight. <laughs> so I went out there, and the closer I got, the more I realized, yes, this really is my train. Now, what is he doing out here? So I said, is everything all right? And he said, oh, it's wonderful. And he started talking about, I know how the world looks like it's going to hell in a handbasket. But it's really not. Everything's going according to plan. Don't worry. And at that point, he looks up into the sky and he began, he throws his hands up and he's speaking a language. I have no idea what it is. And I can usually distinguish foreign languages even if I can't speak them. Because if you travel enough, you get the sort of rhythm. But this one, I had no idea. So I said, well, they're calling me because the car is here to take me to the hotel. And I said, good night. And I realized that when I stepped into the car and they closed the door, it was my tray of closing the door of the car. <laughs> and yet these people standing by would not talk to him. So the next day, I was speaking at a church at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and the minister said, well, I've told the, you know, the congregation about your program, but he said, I really don't think there's going to be many people. Then he came back and said, well, there's standing room only. There just isn't room for everyone. And I said, well, what's happening? He said, well, all these people heard about last night when Maitreya appeared, and they saw him, and they're hoping, I guess, They'll see this again. Well, of course, he did not show up. But what was interesting, at the end of my program, I said, how many saw my trail last night? And there were quite a few of them, and they had all brought their friends with them today. And I said, well, wasn't that the craziest baseball cap you ever saw on his head? Because it was white. He always wears a white hat. But this was a gigantic baseball cap. I with this huge brim out in front. And I'm thinking, where would you buy something like that? <laughs> and this lady in front was shaking her head, and I said, were you there? And she said, it wasn't a baseball cap. He had a huge white crown on his head. And then the guy in back said, no, it wasn't. It was like a giant white baker's hat. And then another guy <laughs> said, no, it wasn't. It was a huge French beret in white. Everybody saw a different hat on his head. So I guess that was his way of saying, you all see me differently. Uh-huh. They probably saw his whole appearance differently. They one. probably did. Uh-huh. They probably hmm. did. But well, that goes, that, that myth that I've been hearing all along, everybody always said nobody has ever seen him, and there was only the one picture so you have dissolved that because that's what everybody said. Mm-hmm. Nobody had ever really seen him. Maybe it's just uh, like a myth that you've heard of. So now yeah. we know different. <laughs> but um, hmm. uh, that's simply not true. I've, I've, I've literally spoken to prime ministers in foreign countries who told me he occasionally comes in to the cabinet meetings he has with his heads. Uh, so this, this, this Maitreya fellow, whoever he is, is getting around. And <laughs> I know that uh, when I was in Europe, one of the um, Oriental ambassadors to Vienna, Austria, talked to me after, and he said, oh, I'm so glad you talked about this. He said, you know, the the head of our government, and then he started naming other governments in the Orient and said they all have met Maitreya, and Maitreya comes and talks to us, blah, blah, blah. But he said, we really don't know how to tell this to the people. And he said, now you've done it. He said, you're, you know, you're a very brave soul to stand up and say these things. And I said, well, not really. I mean, people can think I'm crazy, but uh, I know that a lot of people have seen him. There are people, you know, we've had several of our past presidents who have met him. 
I, and this is this happens all over the world. And people say, well, why is he focused on these political leaders? And that is a job that he has undertaken because the other masters who work with him said, I don't want to work with politicians. Nobody wanted to do it. So Matre sure. said, well, I'll do it. And uh, because I am somewhat close to him, I... I know that eventually I'm going to have to do a little more in that field as well. So, but there are other masters who will work with other sectors of society, some with the scientists, some with the economists, some with the religious groups, so forth and so on. So they've sort of broken this up. And what is our job, our humans, we humans on this planet, in 2013, I think, is the year when we humans began to get assignments and saying, you will be working with this particular master or this particular extraterrestrial. You will be the guy on the ground in the dense physical, and you will have meetings with your master, and they will discuss with you how best to approach dealing with the shift that will be coming and how to do it with the least amount of pain and suffering. And so we're all going to be, to some extent, very much involved. And I think we should begin to understand that this is part of our work. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in my work, though, we've, I've been telling everyone that we're already in the middle of the shift. You know, it's been happening... I think since 2003, and it's been getting gradually stronger, and yep. we are in the middle of it, and uh, it's a gradual thing. I agree with you entirely. It's been going on for some time. It's just that we have reached sort of, let's say, a middle point, and now things get a little more serious. We've had time to ponder these things. We've had a lot of suggestions being given to us. There's been a lot of talk. You have been talking about this, and it's time for people to realize that this is not some illusion, this is not a game, that it's very real. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think. You see, it, it has been happening for quite a while. Uh, from my point of view, it's been happening since 1977. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, back then... No one, no one would believe anything about this. That's changed tremendously, I believe. And I think you can see it by your audiences that you have, that people are beginning, everybody's beginning to talk about the shift. The IONS people, there's a lot of groups out there who take this very seriously. And now we're going to really get into the part of rebuilding civilization. And that's something I want to talk about at this conference, like how do we in the human kingdom build a new civilization for this new world we're going into? But that's what we keep telling them. You know, it's like a separation. You may see it differently, a separation of the new earth and the old earth, and that there won't be any negativity or anything in the new earth. So... Some of the things, the questions people ask me are a little hard to explain about this. I see it as the separation. That was what we were told. As the one goes into another dimension by changing its vibration and frequency. And yeah, it's, you I know, agree with it's, you entirely. You know, the ones who are going to go, they have to change their frequency and vibration also. But then the ones that are into the negativity and have no desire to change will stay with what they have created in the old earth. Is that the way you see it? I think we agree. Okay. Because I still have a lot of questions people so, ask me that I can't really explain. So when you talk about this rebuilding and everything, is that just be, within this new frequency, it's just because all the old things are falling away so that it's being very conscious of what we are creating and what we're building? Is that what you mean? or? Well, you can go all the way back to Helena Blavatsky 
and the book yeah. she wrote, The Secret Doctrine, back in 1888, I believe. Well, that's quite a long time ago. And she said, there is in our soon coming future a time when all the past will disappear and humanity will have to learn how to function in a new world that the past will be of no help in creating a new society. And that's exactly what it is about. Really, when we transition, there's nothing in this old world that will be useful to us to use as a guideline for building the new world. Uh-huh. Uh, like some people have, yeah, it, some people have called it the wilderness experience because it is very much like, you know, the wagon train going west in the 1850s. You had to depend on each other. You had to build this camaraderie of brotherhood or you would perish. But you couldn't, it didn't matter what was back east. You had to build a new life out in the prairie with very little to uh to go by except your own skills. So we're going into this new world and everything has to be left behind. Um, that's going to be rather traumatic. And like you said, Dolores, some people just won't want to do this and they'll have to stay behind. Well, I was told eventually they'll all get there anyway, but it's just yeah, that now because there will be a separation. Oh, that makes sense. There's always... Ah, in your lectures, you're always trailblazers, way showers, all that pioneers. The pioneers. Oh my, that's what that's what this first. Ah, it may finally a <laughs> oh. uh, little light went on well, in your head. Well, I mean, you're always saying that that's what. Yeah, I mean, you have all these waves and all these things, but this whole shift, the ones that are going in this first and this whole thing, those are the way showers for the other ones that will eventually get there once it's all because. That is, that's a great challenge, and that can be very scary to go, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going to do something. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's right. It's it always a way when the when step right, out, right. they always have difficulty. Mm-hmm. It takes a lot of... And they feel alone, too, because nobody yeah. understands. Hmm. But we'll have the ability to see the fifth kingdom, which will make a big difference. And right. when you yeah. do this building... Also, to be able to at will see the angels, the Deva kingdom, they are the builders. But they Mm -hmm. will only build what they're told to build. And we humanity are at that point where our advanced mental abilities are now getting strong enough that we can visualize what we need and it will be built by the Devas. Back in old Atlantis, when they had this connection with the devas, humans abused that relationship, and they were yeah. greedy, and they forced the devas to build things against their will for personal gain. And that's what we call black magic. We don't want to do that black magic again. We want to build with the devas in a positive way, something that helps everyone in society. That's the difference between now and old Atlantis. And because we abuse the Davis so badly in Atlantis, we have been cut off from them for a very long time. So now is our new new opportunity to reunite and work together again. Well, that's what... Um I've been doing lectures and seminars on, too, is creating your own reality, realizing you do have the power to create anything you want. And that's what you were saying. We're beginning to get these abilities back and understand we do have the power to create the world that we want to be in. Well, like you said, it's stronger and stronger, and you can see that. The manifesting time is faster um, than it used to be. It, it could have taken. I mean, it could have taken a whole life to manifest something. Where now, it's very quick. Uh, it can be within moments sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's what we've learned. That all you have to do is think it, and it'll become true. 
or before you had a little time in there. Do you really want to do this before you were allowed to do it? But now you know, just give the think it, and it's there. Mm-hmm. Yes, and that's a fascinating topic. Mm-hmm. But we have to learn to be very prudent about what we do, and mm-hmm. uh, we have to morally know what is going to be useful and not harmful. And uh, having that discernment is very important. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's why you always tell people, be careful what you ask for, because you might get it. Yes. And once you do materialize it, you can't just say, oh, I've changed my mind now. Well, I think that's why there's a, there's a, <clears throat> a course. I mean, it's like it takes you through all of this. Part of it's beginning to realize you are responsible for your thoughts. Your thoughts are what create it. So you start harnessing those and get them under, you know, where you're paying attention to them. That usually makes you more responsible for what you start creating. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But I tell people, it's like having a baby. You can't decide, oh, I don't want it, and I'm going to send it back. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be careful what you ask for. So in the conference, you're going to are you going to give um, more? What am I trying to say? Um, some pointers, or? yeah, things of actually. That's one of the things I was I was impressed with. It was like because so much of the time, you know, metaphysics, it's all we're all in this woo woo state, and and there's nothing real practical to apply yeah. to things. Well, that's how I saw you was you can you have something practical to give people instructions. You mean or well, guidelines? That is a very good point, and I do know uh, what I will simply call, you know, new age people who actually think of themselves as teachers, and they don't really believe that we as a human race need to do anything, that we can just sit back and watch what is happening without lifting a finger, because it's all automatic pilot and it will just happen. And I argue with them that's not the way things work, because humanity must be a link between the higher spiritual and Mother Nature. And it's this whole thing of transference of energy, if nothing else. But people have to know what they're doing. And people do have to build this new civilization. We have to be, well, at least the more advanced souls on this planet have to be very involved in what is going on. They cannot just say, we don't need to be there. I have people who said, well, the fifth kingdom of the masters, they'll do it all. No, they won't. They can't. There are universal laws that forbid them from doing too much for us. There are higher spiritual beings who make a plan that says, the masters can't do this all. They can guide, but they cannot do the work. It is humanity that must do the work. So I'm very much at odds with a lot of um, uh, New Age groups that think nothing needs to be worked on by humans. We just sit and watch it happen. I don't believe that's the way it works. Well, see, we do have free will, and that's why they can't interfere with the free will. But when people are talking about creating their reality and creating what they want, you can't just say, this is what I want, and then just sit on the couch. You've got to have action also to make it become a reality. Absolutely. It's not just going to appear because you want it. Right, and then as far as like what you're saying, I totally agree. As far as like all of these things happening, I mean, I I feel like what I saw here was we all took our positions. When we came in and and now, and as everybody's still moving around, we're all taking our positions for these different parts that we're playing. And there are the masters, there are the ones that are on this level, we chose this one because this is the action level. This is the one to do the work. And then we have the guidance and we have everything we need from the fifth. Like I said, all these other dimensions are here to help us. But we right. are the ones that have to do the work. It's not going to be handed to us right. because then it wouldn't be a lesson. It wouldn't serve a purpose. Exactly. That's right. You there would be nothing to gain. Else would be work, you know. Yeah, this is the way we create our spirituality and expand our consciousness. 
is by doing it ourselves. Otherwise, there's no purpose in having an incarnation. Well, exactly. What's the point? <laughs> yeah. And what would be the, the fun out of it if, if it mm-hmm. just handed to you? Mm-hmm. A lot of times you have to work for something to really appreciate, appreciate it. it Yeah, and have the benefit of it. it. It just handed to you. That's the way a lot of people are. Things are handed to them, and then they don't really appreciate it. Hmm. Right. So I I look forward to our our getting together down in Arkansas. Uh, uh-huh. I think this is going to be uh, very interesting, and uh, to meet new people, a new audience is always a great honor. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to get out, and uh, this is why I some years ago I was invited to speak at the national platform. Society in Washington D.C. This is this is something that was created by Daniel Webster a long time ago, and it's very much today a political organization. And I kept phoning the headquarters in Washington, saying, "Are you sure you have the right Wayne Peterson? Because do you know what I actually talk about? Because I know your <laughs> program is all political." And they said, "Yes, we know it." You, you know who you are, and yes, we want you to speak, and yes, you're the only person that gets twice as much time as everybody else. So I was really getting worried. How do I approach these? You know, there are people who go to that event that I only see on television uh, because of their political connections. I said, well, how am I going to start to put this together? So... What really bothered me was that the moment it was time for me to speak, the C or the um, C-SPAN people came in to film it, <laughs> and I thought this could be good or this could be very bad. <laughs> but I, I did the talk, and um, a reporter from the Washington Post was there, and they actually did a very good article. But it was nice to be, for a time away from anybody who you might call interested in the New Age. I was now speaking to an audience with people from the Pentagon and, you know, the politics of Washington. It was a totally different audience. But it went pretty well, considering this new audience. But that was was probably the most removed from the sort of New Age groups that I had ever spoken to. Uh-huh. Well, do you see all these, these different, because you're seeing a different cross-section, so in these different groups, are you seeing um, similar things? Like, are they aware that changes are taking place? And Well, things, not, things that's on? a good question, because I always tell people that the Americans seem to be the least connected, that mm. when I have spoken to people in Europe, the audience are larger, I mean really larger, and they they know something about this topic, and I can tell from the questions they ask. And the types of people that show up are very different. Uh, I remember in, in Vienna, and uh, they had the first two rows set aside in this auditorium for the diplomatic corps, and they're all filled. And the Mm. vice chancellor of Austria was in the audience. Later I saw him talking to Maitreya. Uh But they seem to understand that the world is changing. They see the dangers. They see the collapse of the old, and they're frightened because they're not quite sure what's coming because nobody knows what's coming because we haven't built it yet. But they know the current system, they know the current political, economic, and even religious systems don't look like they're going to survive. So they're out there saying, what is happening? Well, in the United States, everybody is very content. They don't see the dangers. We're such a big country and (laughs) such a, a... country so powerful politically and in every other way that they just feel that 
nothing can happen. I think mm. when the euro finally collapses, this will change. Uh, the European Union is coming apart, and that's a good thing. Uh, it's not doing what it needs to do, and something new has to be created there as well. And so the Europeans are sensitive, the Japanese are sensitive, and Krem always told me the largest audiences he ever has are in the Far East, mainly Japan and uh, Taiwan. They understand mm -hmm. this. But Americans do not. And well, see, I just I returned a few months ago from China. The first time I spoke in Shanghai on the mainland, and the people they came from all over China for the lecture in my class, and they got it, and I, they were very excited about these things. So I know mm -hmm. people all over the world are are they're into this and they're really right. understanding it. Right. We're going yeah, to have to Yeah, we're going to have to we're watching the clock here because he'll turn us off. But I'm seeing this, I'm also seeing the younger generation is really interested and they're getting it too. Okay, but Wayne, before we have to sign off, uh if people want to contact you, how do you want them to do it? Um <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I, I website really have to, or whatever. well, um, I do have one email address that I think I could use, and it is my initials, W S P uh, N E V, abbreviation for Nevada. So it's W S P N E V at gmail dot com, and um, that is. One of the sites I sort of try to keep open for others to reach me. Okay, but but Wayne will be speaking at our conference just in a few weeks, mm -hmm. yeah. and here the Seventh Transformation Conference in Rogers, Arkansas, July 13th to the 15th. Mm -hmm. Anybody who wants more information, check in on our website. Right. You can just type in DoloresCannon.com, mm -hmm. and you'll have all the schedules and all the information. But Wayne is going to be there to give a lot more information than he just now gave. So it's going to be time for us to go. But, Wayne, thanks for coming on tonight. Oh, uh, Thank you, Dolores. And we're going to see wonderful. you in a few weeks. And nice. thanks, everyone, for listening tonight. Good night. Good night. Make it great. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.